What's up Zoms? Today we're going to examine the game that is often forgotten. It's the amazing Resident Evil 3. Easter eggs, secret explosions, egg monsters, things cut in development, and so many other cool things. This is WB's guide of RE Easter eggs, secrets, and stories from Resident Evil 3. Resident While RE2 technically had the first RE in-game shootable object, RE3 was the real OG. The game even added a second auto-aim button so you could aim at enemies or shootable objects. The most common shootable and most video game trope are the red barrels, introduced to the RE series in RE3. Next, at various points in the game, you will see these red wall charges. They are extra bright and hard to miss. Most of us discovered those pretty easily. Next is the steam valve in the pharmacy, which is pretty helpful. And later there's valves again, and this time it's acid that you use to defeat the nemesis. Finally are three secrets that I had no idea existed as a kid. First, did you know you can shoot this crate to take out enemies in the split hallway? Second, did you know you could knock over this lamp to electrocute and finish off the worm? And third, did you know that you can shoot out these gas street lamps to cause a fireball that helps destroy enemies? Let me know in the comments if you knew all of these. You probably remember the annoying drain demos and brain suckers if you ever played RE3. In fact, you probably took them out or ran away so quickly that you never noticed something that blew my mind when I found out years later. Both of these enemies actually lay eggs and the eggs hatch and their babies come to feast on you. These little things aren't just frustrating, but they actually do damage, although they cannot kill you. Again, let me know in the comments if you knew this, because I'm genuinely curious. Did you know that Johnny Depp, Mel Gibson, Winona Ryder, and Hugh Grant are all a part of Resident Evil 3? No, I didn't. Well, they are, and it's part of the biggest mystery of the game, the gas station pop wall. Thanks to Urban Legends, along with 4chan and YouTuber Wang, we know that there is Hugh Grant and Andy McDowell in Four Weddings and a Funeral, Johnny Depp and crew in a photo from Benny and June, the girl from Jurassic Park in Tiger Beat Japan, Mel Gibson and Jodie Foster in a poster from Maverick, the Back to the Future one we showed you in RE2, Winona Ryder in The Age of Innocence, and Kathy Bates and others in A Home of Our Own. As a bonus, around the corner there's even a 90s teen poster of California Dreams. But the full mystery is yet to be solved. Do you know where these other three images might be from or who they might be? Brainstorm away in the comments. Not sure I deserve that. Did you know my biggest crush ever is also in the game? It's Alex Mack, and chill bro, I was also a kid. This is a little different from the wall poster or the cork board, as these two shots of Nickelodeon's Alex Mack are actually framed and a part of the clock tower decor. We showed you how the beginning of RE3 is actually the prequel to RE2, which means Jill is the first one into the RPD during the zombie incident, and Leon and Claire show up later. So, why does Jill find Marvin possibly dead, but the next day, he's back alive. It must be a mistake, right? Well, the answer is... Kinda? In an interview with Carcinogen SDA and CVX Freak, the RE3 director said the official answer is that fatally wounded does not imply death. So Marvin is alive when Jill sees him. Makes sense since a few minutes later when she comes back with Nemesis that he's gone. A similar situation with boarded up doors that miraculously disappear when Claire and Leon show up. The new official answer, survivors are hiding behind there and they unboard the doors later and try to leave. Hey, the director said it, not me. Although I'd love to know his answer on who replaced the glass in this window. And while we're talking about the RPD, you gotta check out our Resident Evil 2 video to see the easter eggs like Welcome, Jojo, and so many others that repeat in RE3. Sorry, but it looks like your party has been cancelled. You can actually see time pass as the game goes on. Before you hit the RPD, Raccoon City looks alright, but when you leave, it's definitely nighttime and the lights turn on and it's darker. When you get to the cable car, there's a clock that says it's 10.30pm. 
When you arrive at the clock tower, it's 11 p.m. And when Jill fights Nemesis, it's right at midnight. Then she gets knocked out and falls asleep and wakes up after the events of Resident Evil 2. And I do think that this truck in the background here is the one that crashes in the Resident Evil 2 intro. Why'd he bite me? It's probably just another one of those timing errors and they really wanted to put it in there to show you that the two worlds are the same. As you are walking to the restaurant, you will see a poster on the wall for Biohazard 4. It features the zombie from the RE2 cover. In 1999, when this game came out, RE4 was in development. But did you know that 1999 version actually ended up becoming Devil May Cry? Devil May Cry. So technically, it's a Devil May Cry poster. Lock off, Featherface! A new Capcom survival horror game called Dino Crisis came out the same year as Resident Evil 3, and the games were connected by more than the fact that each of them had a demo of the other included when you bought them. When you are in the hospital with Carlos, there are two posters of Dino Crisis on the wall in the lobby. One has the name and the game's release date, and the other is the screen when you beat the game. By the way, in Dino Crisis, you can move and shoot at the same time. This was originally supposed to be in Resident Evil 3, but was never done. And of course, this is a good spot to mention one of the secret costumes. It converts Jill into the main character from Dino Crisis, Regina. This isn't a joke, you idiot. This is by far the coolest secret in the game. You probably remember this cutscene in Resident Evil 2. A chopper comes by and drops Mr. X from the sky to terrorize Leon and Claire. However, let's rewind. There appear to be five other canisters. Do they all have Mr. X tyrants inside, and where did they go? Well, at the end of RE3, we get that answer. Right before the final boss, you see carnage everywhere. There are dead mercenaries and evidence of a firefight. Now start to look around. There's one, two, three, four, and five dead tyrants all right here. That means the RE2 cutscene was real and there were six tyrants, one taken out by Leon and Claire, and the other five in this battle. You lose, big guy. Speaking of tyrant, when you are changing costumes at the boutique, if you look closely on one of the shelves, you can see a tiny little tyrant action figure down there. Hey, maybe it was made by McFarlane Toys, one of the companies mentioned in the background text of Resident Evil 3. And something we missed in our RE2 video that returns in RE3 is the RPD computer screen. It shows the lab where you fight tyrant in RE1 and has a tyrant icon at the bottom. And while we're in the boutique, let's talk about the bonus costumes. We already showed you Regina from Dino Crisis, but there's also Disco Jill, who is literally staying alive. Well, you can't tell by the way I use my Leather Mommy Jill, Officer Meter Maid, Classic RE1 Jill, and there are three more casual outfits you'll find on Dreamcast or PC. So how do you get them? No Brad Zombie here, merely beat the game and the key will be in your inventory the next playthrough or on a PC or Dreamcast, you get them all up front. The first character Jill encounters is Dario. His cutscene is very unintentionally funny and very memorable. Now leave me alone! What if I told you his voice actor was actually at one time a cast member on Saturday Night Live with Eddie Murphy? Well, it's true. It's Tony Rosada, R.I.P. You might also know him as the voice of Luigi on the Mario cartoon. Stop calling me mama. <laughs> mama Luigi. Rosada was epic as Dario, but wait, there's one more thing. I'm not leaving. Rumor has it that Rosada actually did the voice of Nemesis as well. Stars. Speaking of Dario, whatever happened to him after we left him in that crate? Well, later in the game, you can actually backtrack all the way back to the beginning, and hey, where'd he go? Oh, dagger. The only thing left behind was his journal, in which he says he wanted to be a writer, but his mom said he sucked. Classic Dario. What do you think you're talking about? Dario wasn't the only character to meet their fate that day. There was also the mysterious lady in pink. 
you might have seen her running around town as you were walking through Raccoon City. Eventually, you catch up to her and zombies have taken her out. There is no way to save this person. The developers said we should make our own choice on who it is, but a lot of people think it's Dario's daughter. I just lost my daughter out there! The Sakura Easter Egg in Resident Evil 2 returns in Resident Evil 3, but there's an additional Street Fighter Easter Egg. That's right, Eagle's Pet Shop is named after this character, Eagle, from the Street Fighter series. Right after the Nemesis Acid Battle, if you look underneath the dead scientist who dropped the card, you will see he is laying on top of an ivy plant. The ivy is an enemy from Resident Evil 2 that does not appear in Resident Evil 3. Ever try to fight Nemesis? It's not easy, especially the first time. I mean the guy can dodge your attacks. You may have figured out that he only has five rockets, so you can dodge him five times to make him lose that attack. You can also get lucky and shoot his rocket mid-air. What you may not have known is there are different ways to scam this boss in almost every encounter. Because the boss is so big, he'll often get stuck in certain places, and you can take advantage. The game allows you to run away from Nemi, Ow, that killed. but there's an advantage to fighting. Each time you cut him down, he will drop a special item. This is the only way to unlock the special handgun and special shotgun. There are seven encounters, and if you defeat him in all of them, the final time he will drop an assault rifle. But if you're on your second playthrough or more, he'll drop an infinite ammo, which you can then add to any weapon. But you can only pick one weapon, and you only have it from the clock tower on. Now, if you want full infinite ammo for all weapons from the start of the game, you'll have to play mercenary mode a ton, earn a ton of money, and purchase it. Look! We're just mercenaries, hired hands. Mercenaries mode is unlocked when you beat the game. It's where you take one of the umbrella mercs through a mini game and try to escape. Typically in RE, when you beat the regular game with a good score, you get good bonus weapons. But in RE3, you have to play this side mode instead. And not just a little bit, like a lot, like 20 to 30 times, in order to unlock the special weapons, which are the assault rifle, the Gatling gun, the rocket launcher, and the all weapon infinite ammo. In this mode, there's also a bonus to rescue hostages. You've got Dario, you've got Brad, you've got Marvin from RE2, and you've got the girl that comes on the computer screen in the pharmacy, I think, plus one of the USB-C guys. And it's really hard, so if you've never beaten it, you might have never seen the end screen. It's actually Chief Irons from RE2 handing over a package. That was impressive. In the beginning, Resident Evil 3 was not supposed to be Resident Evil 3. It was supposed to be The Last Escape, a side game not part of the main storyline with more of an indie flair. However, Capcom thought sequels would sell better than side games, so kind of forced this game into the main series, into 3, when really Code Veronica was supposed to be the real Resident Evil 3. Father! While we're talking development, it's time for the cut items that remain in the code. First, we have the infamous demon coins. They look really cool. Next, we have two puzzle items that were cut and given to us whole. That is the fire hose, which used to have an adapter, and the TV remote and batteries, which became just part of the game. There's also something called Giga Oil and this chain. And remember Tofu from RE2? Well, he's back. This hitbox was left behind in the mercenaries mode. There are also some prototype intro screens that are hidden in the code as well. The stars return home, they tell the cops what happened and they aren't believed, and Jill is mad and ready for revenge. Pretty neat, and wait, look at the bottom here. That's Shawshank Redemption here in the corner. WTF. Get busy living. Get busy, die. RE3 added decision making with the white choose your own adventure choices, but it was really confusing because I never knew which choices did what and why my cutscenes were always different. So here are the main choices that impact the story and cutscenes. First, if you go to the newspaper first, you meet Carlos there. Glad to meet you, lady. If you go to the restaurant first, you meet Carlos there. Calm down, lady. I'm no zombie. 
Next, when Nemesis attacks both of you, run and Nikolai goes to the gas station and Carlos to the sales office or do the attack one where Nemesis drops something and Nikolai will go to the sales office and Carlos will be at the gas station. If you go to the cable car early, you'll see a special Mikael cutscene. In the electric place, if you run out the back door, you'll get a Nemesis encounter where he starts on the roof. In the cable car, if you hit the brake, you slap Carlos. Uh. And then he helps you fight Nemesis. If you jump out, he'll give you some extra freeze rounds, but he will not show up to help. In the hospital, go up first and Nikolai takes out Tyrell. Go in the basement and he takes himself out. And at the end, push Nemesis off the bridge, meet Carlos in the storeroom, or jump off and get saved by Carlos in the basement. Barry, where's Barry? We missed one big thing. There are two endings in RE3, and your ending is determined by only one of the key decisions in the game, whether or not you jump off the bridge. If you decide to push Nemesis off, you will get an ending where Nikolai dies and where Carlos flies the chopper and rescues Jill. Seems good, but this is not the best ending. If you want the good ending, you must jump off the bridge. This keeps Nikolai alive and brings back the best character in RE history. Relax, beautiful. My name's Steve. No, not you. Shut up! During this game path, you will enter the control room and a mysterious yet familiar voice will come over the radio. Here, are you there to come? Then, when you beat the boss, a new helicopter will come to pick you up. And who is driving? Barry. Is it you? Yeah. There's also a slight twist in the Barry ending that doesn't actually impact the ending movie. When you face Nikolai, if you shoot him down, he dies, which apparently is not canon. So you want to negotiate and let him leave. It's not confirmed, but this has to be the best ending. And it's the only one where Carlos does a flying fist pump at the end. Yes! Which I believe is the devs telling us this is the true ending. Yeah. Speaking of the ending, there are a few things you might be curious about. First, what if your time runs out on the Nemi acid fight or on the final boss fight? Well, the screen goes white, you die, and there's not a cool end screen, kind of a dud. Second, what if you don't give Nemesis the stars and finish him off? Nothing happens, you beat the game anyway. We call that the catastrophe. Third, what if you don't make a decision at all? Well, Nemesis will spit on you, poison you, possibly kill you, then die, but you can still escape. After the ending come the epilogues, and wow, you have to beat the game eight times on the same save file to unlock them all. They contain some backstory on characters, and you can go online and read the specifics for yourself, but they're for Jill, Chris, Barry, Leon, Claire, Sherry, Ada, and Hunk. If you catch them all, you get this special message. Ooh, special. And a little Easter egg here on the epilogue screen, or so people say. To me, it looks like it says Tom Garber blah 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 blah, but people say it says I love you Shinji Mikami, and he's the man behind getting the Resident Evil series started. And if you have a clear picture that shows that, please send it to me. The box decision doesn't really do anything, but if you do drop down, you will see the skin from the Gravedigger Worm. That's showing that he is malting his skin and getting bigger and becoming more powerful. You know that bell Carlos has to push to get to the hospital? Well, if you try to do it with Jill, she's not strong enough and she gets frustrated and there's a special little cutscene that happens. This is also a good time to show you some of the Jill sound effects, real sound effects in the game. Hide the children, here they are. When Jill's not making those noises, she's writing her diary, and the only way to uncover this secret in the game is to collect all 30 notes in the game. The only catch is you have to pick them up all in the exact correct numerical order. You can read the note online, it basically leads us to Chris's story in Code Veronica. If you're watching this video, you're probably like, awesome, Barry's gonna show us how to dodge. A new technique added to RE3. <laughs> yeah, right. Dodging is impossible, it happens a lot by accident, and in the clip on screen, I kind of figured it out for a second, but it never works in the real game. 
ever walk into a room and the items that were there last time are gone or different, or go to solve a puzzle and the solution didn't work. That's because RE3 introduced randomization on some items, puzzles, and enemies. The main one is which weapon shows up in the star's locker. Will it be the grenade launcher or the magnum? Interesting note here, if you watch an RE3 speedrunner, if they don't get the grenade launcher, they automatically reset the game. That's just no way around it. That's just the nature of the game. RE3 brought ammo crafting into the series, where Jill could find gunpowders and combine them together or with grenades to make different types of ammo. However, there was something I think I never discovered as a kid. If you combine eight gunpowders eight times, it will allow you to turn your created ammo into enhanced ammo. Same goes for B with enhanced shotgun ammo. Weirdly enough, you can only use this ammo in the original gun and not the upgraded weapons. Not only did the devs sneak Capcom in, but they snuck themselves in too. The director's name means Blue Mountain like the warehouse where Dario is. You'll find Yuki from graphics in multiple places throughout the game. And the background designer's name means Big West, another sneaky little addition. In the original version of the game, there is an audio puzzle where you have to listen to music notes to solve it, and it's random. In future versions of the game, however, there is only one exact solution to the puzzle, and it is revealed in text. Seems too easy, but this was done to allow the hearing impaired to progress in the game. And now it's time for the speed round. Fake Burger King, Burger Kong returns. There's Fake Taco Bell, Rocco Bell. And there's Fake 7 Up, 7 Down. The Playboy from RE2 is back, as is the DeLorean, which is from Back to the Future. There are a few signs of Kendo. There's a painting of the Arclay Mountains where RE1 took place. And there's a sign for a band called Big E, which you can see is a band kind of there. So it's probably not a Biggie Smalls reference, but he did die right before the game came out, so maybe? So that's a whole lot of secrets, Easter eggs, and stories from Resident Evil 3. Did you know all of these? Did we miss anything important? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to check out our RE1 and RE2 videos and let me know if we should do Code Veronica. I'm Where's Barry, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye, Amanda.